Hello, everybody. So far, we have a, all, only a couple of people viewing, but I think we're going to have more and more as we start speaking about our today's topic. And Gedminas, can you introduce our today's topic? What are we going to talk about today? Today, we're going to talk about uh, CSS Grid feature, feature of CSS called CSS Grid, and how it how we can use the, this feature to build layouts. OK. And if you had to tell me, right, why did you choose this topic? Why is it close to your heart, maybe? What's the reason well, for that? Uh, yeah, I think the main reason why I chose to talk about this because myself personally think uh, of this feature as the greatest one introduced into CSS language. And I think it changed a lot and basically changed the way we build layouts. So created okay. some kind of like a standard. Okay, and can you also reveal the secret? What are people going to learn today or maybe as you watch the webinar? What can they learn about layout building? Well, first of all, uh, we're gonna learn of the grid uh, in general, what it is and the, a little bit of history of, of the grid and then how we um, were dealing with the layouts in web design with, before the CSS feature. Uh, what problems we had in the past and how that uh, CSS grid feature helps us to solve them. And also at the very end, we'll talk about the WordPress users, how they can take advantage of this CSS grid as well. So even if you don't want to code anything, you can still uh, be able to use this feature. Okay, perfect, perfect. So are you telling us that there are going to be some maybe hacks of how to make your website more impressive or some very simple tips that might you know make a big difference as well uh for wordpress users i only have a couple suggestions maybe some thoughts of how they can improve or start using it and uh, yeah a couple techniques of without uh, even for people who don't know how to code uh, will be useful i think but mostly this uh, uh, presentation or webinar will be focused on uh, css feature alone so what are the possible options, how to use them, how to get started uh, if you never touched that feature before. OK, well, sounds perfect. OK, so I think we can get in the presentation mood step by step. I can see that you're very, you know, maybe festive, maybe holiday mood. I can see like the shirt. So I know <laughs> both of us are tropical. I can see a very nice yeah. picture in the background. OK. Yes, yeah, it's, it's very hot. It is. How was the temperature there? I think it's around 30. OK, so 30 degrees in Lithuania. I think that's melting hot. Hopefully, no, everybody's not melting. No, as people are joining in, they can maybe relax. Me, myself, I'm broadcasting from Belgium, so I'm very, very comfortable where I am as well at the moment. OK, get in enough. So whenever you're ready, just give me some you know, very specific sign, and the floor is yours. You can start talking about layout techniques. OK, so can we share uh, my of screen? Of course. Yep. OK. Okay, so yeah, as I uh, said, uh, mentioned earlier, this is going to be the topic, CSS grid layouts, and the structure of this webinar is going to be kind of like uh, divided into these parts. So first, we're going to talk about what is grid in general, about uh, history, how we um, use this grid nowadays. Uh, the second was uh, some problems related to the web design building layouts before this CSS uh, grid feature, and uh, for those who are new in CSS and coding in general, I'm going to give you some um, like a quick um, course or crash course on how to get started with CSS Grid. And uh, then we're going to move to WordPress users and talk about how you can apply some uh, knowledge learned uh, in your WordPress site, on your WordPress site. And maybe if you even if you don't want to code anything, how you can also take advantage of CSS Grid. And lastly, we're going to have a questions and answers session. So you can write all your questions in a chat and later I'll be, uh, well, hopefully I'll be able to answer them. And yeah, for, for now, it, maybe if you are watching and you're a developer or already know some uh, things, uh, some things about CSS Grid, so just let me know in the comments. Uh, it would be interesting to see how, how many of you know that. So let's begin. So what is Grid first? Uh, it started a long, long time ago, somewhere in a galaxy. <laughs> well, it, it has actually started with this um, handwritten uh, books. So the grid basically was those lines which help um, uh, you know, people who write with their hands um, 
to have that nice uh, you know consistency it would be very uh, hard and tricky to write this kind of amazing uh, lettering uh, without any helplines so that was the first kind of like grid uh, and mostly uh, this type of work uh, was done by by the monks monks i mean people uh, who don't have families they 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 have lots of time and patience imagine if you make a mistake somewhere you need to redo everything again so that's very hard work and grit here helped to be uh, more i mean maybe more precise and you know easier to make it easier for them to do that next uh, another uh, interesting uh, point in history was when we started doing things uh, with print so print alone um, was uh, the typeface alone was some kind of like a grid uh, but uh, taking a, a, another next step further uh, you see in this example we have pages which have some uh, different uh, tiles different sizes of the tiles those are ads and nowadays you can see similar ads in uh, newspapers so that creates another type of grid and the larger ad size you 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 want to purchase of course the more money you need to pay for that so the size really important here and at the same time it helps um, to make a much more interesting layout and yeah so another important thing after that in history was uh, in, uh, well there was a movement the Bauhaus movement and the futurist movement and they were exploring the grid even further and tried to make it more playful tried to tried to to work with the grid uh, and and break a bit of the boundaries of it but still kept the structure and uh, you know the page layout is nicely designed and consistent it has some structure in it and of course we need to also mention uh, the masters of the grid system swiss style designers like uh, Brockman and Gernstner. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the, the names correctly, but you see the, the title here. Uh, so those are the grid systems. Um, well, this is like a kind of like a history of what happened and, and what we have now. So we can divide those different types, uh, types of grids in, into uh, four categories. So the first and the most simple one is this manuscript grid. Basically, it's a rectangular shape which uh, usually uh, just you know, shows the page margins. Uh, the other one, the second one, column grid is the most popular one. Uh, this is uh, where we can use uh, the column grid layout. Uh, yeah, yeah, usually you, you can see this type of uh, column grid uh, in, on a newspapers or magazines. So modular grid is like a two dimensional uh, way to do to help a designers place um, content. So it's not only um, for the horizontal axis, but also for the vertical axis. And the last type is the hierarchical grid. It looks like it does not grid at all, but it's too much, uh, well, it doesn't have any consistent spacing. The shapes uh, and forms can be different, but they still have some kind of uh, relation to each other. And that's why I think it's called hierarchical because it shows the hierarchy. So. All these um, types of, yep. Yes, there's a I wanted to say, I'm just looking at all these different types of grids and I have a question, which is your favorite type? Do you have a preference of grid? I think the favorite one, which is the most useful one and you use the most, so column grid together with modular grid uh, because in web design, we are still building, well, using this type of grids. And okay. of course, hierarchical grid is for mostly for those nice, uh, interesting uh, dynamic posters and print design. Although it is possible to do something similar in web as well. So okay. uh, the well, answer would, would be, I don't have any favorite. I, I, I try to use uh, the one which is appropriate for my tasks. Okay, well, I'm happy with the answer. And if anybody else has any questions, I'll just remind everybody that you can all the time, you can just write it in the comments and I'll just read it out at the end of the presentation. Okay, then please continue getting another. Okay, so let's move to another slide. And you see, this is the, just a random uh, you know, shot of, of the magazine. And right now, just because previously I was talking about the grids, you can clearly see how that grid 
is used here. Try to draw uh, those uh, lines in your imagination to align columns and, and rows at the same time and, and see how many of them you can see them. You can see it here. So those helplines basically is the grid. And you see the page numbers in the corners, they are all aligned perfectly. The titles, the, the paragraphs, all the different columns. Um, it doesn't look very boring. It has that dynamic because some uh, things are overlapping on other things. We have different color and different shapes and sizes. Uh, but the grid is used here. So imagine if, if we don't have any structure, it will look uh, like a mess. It doesn't have uh, much, uh, yeah, it doesn't have an order or, or structure. So grid helps us to create not only the visual interest, but also uh, keep uh, information organized. So uh, the way to build this kind of layout, designers use tools or programs like Adobe InDesign here. The screenshot of this application is a bit old. You see that there's a version version CS3. Now we have the version Creative Suite. I don't know which one, but it's it's uh, way. Well, it doesn't change much, but it looks a lot cleaner now if you compare to the new application. Um, also, this is not the one you can use to build this kind of layouts. Of course, you can use other tools like uh, Affinity Publisher or Color Draw. Uh, all those applications will be able to create those grids yourself. So you see those purple lines or cyan lines, uh, those lines are help lines. They're not gonna be printed. Those lines are here just for designers so they can align columns, uh, make equal columns uh, or you know have some columns or text spanning multiple columns. In here, as you see here in this uh, uh, first, on the first, first page, uh, we have the title and then we have pictures. Some elements are basically not uh, restricted to, to the grid. You see those uh, images, they span, they even go from one page to another and they span a couple uh, columns. And that's also good because uh, not everything has to be aligned to the grid. It is easy to do this on a paper, but not that very easy to do on the web. Because the, the main difference is because of, the, of the web design and, the, and this graphic design of, or designing for print is that in web design, nowadays, we need to think of the uh, different screen sizes. We cannot use the fixed size um, measurement units or some, somewhere we need to use, but mostly we need to think in percentages or some other um, fluid measurement units. And uh, that creates uh, uh, one, uh, that's one of the difference. Another difference is that before CSS grid feature, we didn't have a, a way to define the grid first and then put the content into there. Uh, the way designers do, graphic designers do, they of course first create a grid like the, those column margins and then maybe some helpline uh, uh, guidelines, uh, helplines, and then they put the content and, uh, and aligned and arrange content based on that. In web design, if we compare, we use a completely different approach, basically like in reverse. Uh, it looks like it's a grid here because we have this overlay of this uh, uh, red uh, columns with some transparency and under, under that you see those card designs. So the first row is the two cards, then the second row will have three cards and so on. And that's the very popular common uh, 12 column grid. So frameworks, CSS frameworks like Bootstrap uses that grid to, well, it helps uh, web developers they, if, you, if they use that framework to build those kind of layouts very easily. But if you look at the, from the technical side, it's not it's not built uh, this way. So we don't create the grid first and then we put the content. We create the we actually create the content to match the grid. Okay, so we we need to think of those styles first, the sizes, the width of those styles, and then the margins and spacing, and and how they naturally flow in a document, an HTML document, because usually, you know, we read from left to right, from top to bottom, and this is exactly the same order how those elements will be placed on a HTML page. Uh, so in order to kind of create this type of grid, we need to first think of the content of the card width and uh, how many will be in a row and how wide they're gonna be just to make, uh, just to match that grid. So technically there's no grid, it's just an illusion that we use some kind of grid here because the content matches that grid if we put the overlay on top of it. Okay, so that was, uh, yeah, that, that was taken from the bootstrap 
framework, but you can build your own CSS grid similar this way. But today's topic will be how we can start working as a designers. If we go back to the slide, how we can start create, how we can first create a grid and then place the content anywhere we like according to that grid. So that's a completely different approach than it is, it, it is used here. We need to kind of start thinking completely different or differently. If you are new uh, in, in the web design or in, in coding uh, and you start working right now, and, and you, the first thing you need to learn, of course, is how to build the layouts. And you're probably gonna pick CSS grid because it's, it's uh, right nowadays it's like a standard way of maybe using some some way using Flexbox, but still we have those tools. In the past, we didn't have those features. So we need to have, uh, we, we need to find the way how to hack things to make it look like we want. And uh, yeah, so this is where I'm gonna share some about some problems we had in the past. So for you as a new designer or new developer will be very tricky to, to well, to not think why, how, how to build the layout without using CSS grid. Yeah, let, let, let me put it this way, because uh, for the older developers, you know, who already have some experience building layouts the old way, CSS grid could be completely uh, different. You know, it could, could, could cause some headache to understand first how it works. But for the newcomers, it's very easy because it feels natural. It feels similar to how designers design, design the pages. So yeah, I'm gonna try to illustrate those differences, just uh, talking about some layout problems we had in the past. And uh, I, I just found a, a list of those problems myself here. Of course, there were many, many more problems there, but just the ones which I was struggling with. So the first and the most uh, problematic uh, problem was uh, even before the Flexbox, uh, that uh, collapsing parent uh, thing when using float property of CSS property. Yeah, so if you're old enough to remember the old websites from the 90s, most of them were built using HTML tables. So HTML, HTML tables are still used for building email emails because of those, some um, old email clients which doesn't have any support for the modern, you know, modern way uh, to build the outs. But anyways, this float problem is actually after we, after developers, well, after the switch, after they moved from using tables to using divs and CSS, and, and they wanted to uh, have the structure written in HTML, and then the whole uh, idea of styling everything, to, to style everything was done in CSS. So it separated the, the presentation from the actual content. And this float, uh, this float property was used uh, just to, to hack the way, just to, to have those columns displayed in on the same row, some elements to, to be uh, at the same row. I'm gonna go into those a bit deeper on other slides. So I'm just gonna talk about the next one, equal height columns. Right now it's easy to, be, to solve with Flexbox, but uh, back then it was, uh, it, it was the problem. Also another one, vertical alignment, how to vertically align elements also was a problem. Requires some extra HTML tags to build the layout you want. So that means that you need to introduce more uh, weight to the file size to be able to render the page you want. So extra HTML tags, which are not semantic, doesn't have any meaning, it doesn't do any anything good. It's just basically there to make that layout work. Um, and also it was dif difficult to change the order of elements on the different screen sizes. Imagine you need to have the uh, navigation, the top navigation, which is uh, for desktop users, maybe it's at the very top. You need to have that one at the very bottom or maybe some other elements need to change the order. Uh, without changing HTML order, it was very difficult. And now with the Flexbox and CSS Grid, it is very easy. And for in much more interesting layouts, uh, let's say it's calculating the, the width and height dynamically based on some conditions. Uh, it, it required some JavaScript knowledge to programmatically do some calculations and then changing the, the in inline styles of the elements. So something like Pinterest style layouts wasn't possible before without using JavaScript. Now with the CSS grid, we can solve that problem. So a couple uh, layout problems, I'm gonna go more into, into those uh, problems. And if you uh, already have that problem yourself, 
uh, let me know in the comments. It would be interesting to see if you remember uh, this type of, well, this way of building layouts, because I believe that nowadays no one does this uh, anymore. You see, uh, uh, I have this uh, slide which shows you the, the code. And then on the right-hand side, I did some visual uh, presentation of what's happening and what is the problem. So we have the container class, like a parent element, which holds some two children elements, so left and right. Let's, let's imagine that left and right is, is the columns. We want to make uh, equal columns, let's say 50% each. So they take the full width and have the same amount of, uh, take, take the same amount of width. Um, but the problem is that when we apply the float property, you see on the bottom and we have the left class and the right class, and we have float left and width 50%. So when every element in the, in the parent container is the floated element and that container loses its height, doesn't know where to, uh, well, where to draw that bottom line. What is its uh, what is the height itself? Because it, it, those uh, child elements are taking out from that natural document flow, and that basically imagine if you have you need to have a background color to you know to to take the whole area painted or colored. Uh, you're not gonna see that because that container is collapsed to zero, so it doesn't get any height, and you're never gonna get that background color to appear. Another problem would be if you have some extra elements below the container class. So they will try to, you know, to find their place in the document, trying to fill in the gaps. And they don't see those left and right elements because they are folded elements. So they're gonna try to, uh, you know, put itself where, where they think they should should be. So that uh, in a result, we're gonna get some unexpected uh, you know, outcome, uh, not not the layout we wanted. And that's why, because that flow property was mainly uh, created to, to solve one problem, the text wrapping around the image problem, where we have the image, we wanna float that image to the left or to the right, and the text goes around that image. That was the only reason, uh, that should be the only reason why we need to use that float. So it's not meant to be for the layout. Okay, enough about this problem. Uh, well, this is the problem, right? The, the collapsing parent. Another slide shows the solution, how to fix that. So if you are new to this uh, field, if you're just starting starting to be a, a web programmer, you're probably not gonna be doing this, but if you need to support some legacy code, and if you see something like this, you will now understand what it, why is that this way and what the problem it is solving. So basically, I, I did here, I do use here the, the pseudo element after. In the past, there wasn't a variable, this element, we need to use like an empty uh, HTML tag, like a div with the class clear fix, which basically does the same, it just clears, um, clears that float, just basically tells the container where to draw that bottom line and, and gives that container uh, a way to understand or know what its height should be. Yeah, so that's a solution, one possible solution. Um, yeah, so another problem was equal heights, uh, equal uh, height columns, because by nature in HTML, if we imagine if you have two div elements and you put some text in it, the text dictates, dictates the height. So the more text you have, the, the taller the, the element will become. And if you want to have still to have the same background size and the same color and, and the same height, uh, in the past before Flexbox, I need to use some JavaScript calculation, trying to find the tallest card or tallest, tallest column on that row and then apply the same height to the other columns. Now it's easy to solve that with the Flexbox and this, at the same time, you can save that with CSS Grid because they share similar um, properties and similar ways to solve that problem. Because the flex uh, by default uh, uses that uh, vertical alignment stretch. Yeah, so if you're new to flex, so maybe I would recommend to learn flexbox first and then CSS grid because it would be easier. And then uh, later on, so we can compare and pick the right choice where to solve that problem. And very often users, so well, people who are new to this topic or building layouts with grid uh, asks this question, uh, 
on forums on everywhere um, that what is better flex or, or grid and where to use uh, and what should i use grid grids everywhere or should i stick to flexbox uh, very often flexbox is enough to solve the problem what what the problem flex solves is that it allows us to very easily create even columns or columns based on how much uh, content each element have and we can display those elements in a row or in a column so the row is the default we can switch the axis uh, and, and go to column but the main difference is that the flex is only one directional with the grid you have con control over two dimensions so you can also create the you know the columns and rows you basically draw those guidelines if you imagine those uh, you know help lines or guidelines from indesign document this is what the grid does yeah so we create those helplines and then you create those different areas and then you can place those html elements uh, into that those areas so it's a completely different approach more control over and much more flexible but could be too much for a simple solution like a navigational bar where you have the logo on one side and some um, buttons uh, menu buttons on the right hand side so for that kind of problem you can easily use the flex flex box okay um, yeah, so to understand grid, we need to first learn some terminology. So what is the grid? What is the grid items, lines, tracks, cells, areas, gaps? Um, those are the jargons so you need to understand well because those are the official terms. And sometimes in CSS specification, when you read that one, uh, you, you'll notice and you'll understand what it means. So I'm going to go through each of them very quickly. So the grid, it basically the, itself is the the whole structure itself so it's not only uh the the tracks the lines but basically everything yeah so the whole area so think of this that all the helplines uh, including page margins and uh, ba uh, the lines for for the type the baseline everything is there yeah? so that's the whole grid then for the grid lines is basically those two-dimensional lines which control uh grid tracks so the help lines so guidelines, vertical guidelines, and horizontal guidelines. Um, that really depends on, on you. When you define the grid, how many of those lines you're going to have. Um, so those lines create the grid tracks. So you can think of these grid tracks as the columns or rows. So that's a two-dimensional thing. So uh, vertical, uh, vertically, it's a, it's a column. You can think of this as a column and then horizontally as a row. And then individual cells. So, uh, yeah, so think of this as a tile, maybe, you know, where you can put the content in it. And if you span multiple cells, uh, those are called grid areas. You can define grid areas yourself and maybe give it a name. So then it, it makes it easier for you as a developer to put the content. I'm going to show the code later. So that's the terminology. Oh, and the last one is that you can also apply uh, a grid gap. So it doesn't create any additional lines. It's just like a, making that line thicker and transparent or invisible. So you know, causing two columns to be further away from each other. So you can define the gap yourself. Could be 16 pixels, 30 pixels, any, any amount of, of uh, pixels or other measurement unit. OK, so now it's an instruction on how to get started if you're an integrate and you want to learn it and what you need to do. So on the right hand side, you see some CSS. That's the style sheet uh, language, cascading style sheet. If you're completely new in coding, that might be a bit boring or maybe not very interesting. So also let me know if you're interested in this topic or not. I, I, I won't change the presentation because I already prepared that one, but still uh, it's interesting to see uh, you know, who, who is the audience. So yeah, so firstly, uh, to get started, we need to Kind of like you have three steps first you define the grid the container that's the first thing we do so with this display grid a container is the parent element which calls all the children elements the elements you want to place onto that grid so slice it up in some rows and columns is the next step the second step and you do so with the property called grid template columns and then you provide some measurement units how many uh, how, how how much space how, how wide that column should be so 70 percent and 30 percent gives you two columns one is the first one is 70 percent of the width and the second is 30. 
And also you can do the same with the, for the rows. So grid template rows, and then there's a 20 and 80 VH. So VH is the viewport height, kind of like a percentage of um, a browser window height. So 20 and 80 is gonna be a ratio, like 20% of the height and 80% of the height. Um, and yeah, and then the last step would be to put some items into your grid. And that's completed like, like in reverse order of how we used to do before this CSS grid, because um, if we compare to the float or with the Flexbox, um, we first create the content and then we kind of give the, each content or each element the width, and then it adds up to the actual grid. And with this approach, we do that differently. We first define the grid, we slice it up on that parent element, on that container, and then all the children can be placed onto that grid. So for the grid items, it could be any, any HTML element, it can be image, paragraph, div, anything. And by default, it will span or fit into only one grid cell. So that will automatically will be placed on, on, on your grid if you don't see that explicitly. Okay, so I'm gonna go and, and also talk about the measurement unit, FR. So it does nothing to do with fronts. It's a fraction, FR means the fraction, and that's a fluid measurement unit. And that is all also was introduced with CSS grid feature. So it wasn't there before. So that's why I think it's important to understand how it works. So try, try to solve that equation where it says 70% plus 30% plus 16 pixels, how it's gonna be in total. Okay, so in total, it would be of course 100% plus 16 pixels. So in terms of layout, uh, it's gonna be too wide, yeah, if it's a column, it's too wide, so you're gonna get the scroll bars if, if you do so. So how we can solve that problem? So the, to solve that problem, you need to also, maybe you, you already have experience using the calc fun function. Uh, you know, the calc, and then you can use the percentage minus something with pixels, and then do the calculations, and then give you the fluid um, amount of, of uh, you know, the, the value. So instead of using percentage, it's better with the uh, grid to use the fractions because that will automatically shrink or grow based on the ratio you provide. So instead of 70% and 30%, you can say two fraction and one fraction. That ratio is similar, not exactly the same, but it, uh, it won't cause any problems when you have that grid gap added by 16 pixels. And the fraction basically is like a free space. Yeah, think of this as a free space. Base, and it's this similar to how flex grow or flex shrink works. So the way the browser calculates the space is first it takes the fixed value, pixels or m's, and then um, based on that ratio, we'll reduce the size of the width um, you know, of those fraction units. Hopefully that makes sense because that's very tricky to explain. And then we need to place the grid items. And this is this can happen automatically or can, can happen manually. So if you don't say anything where anything to the browser where to place those items, the children elements, they're gonna be placed automatically from top to bottom, from left to right, like in a Z shape, and that's a, that's the order. And maybe sometimes this is exactly what you want. So you don't need to do anything else. Um, yeah, but then we have another problem. Let's say if, if the item is too large, it doesn't fit. Let's say it has to, you know, to, to stand some, um, yeah, if you give a height to some, give a width or some, um, like a height or width uh, property to some element, it might leave some empty spaces behind. On the right hand side here, you see the code examples where we can manually set each item where to go. So I, I'm, I'm using the same item dash one, that's one element, but just the different ways to tell the browser where to put them. So you see the numbers like one and three. So that's basically the numbers of the lines, those guidelines, you can imagine them or sometimes you need to maybe just draw that on the paper, paper while designing it. So you know, keeping that as a reference because it's very hard to, well, it's very easy to forget uh, how many lines you have on your grid. So yeah, so you, you tell where to start and where to end, so that automatically spans uh, two columns and so. And you can same, you can do the same for the row. The easier syntax would be with the forward slash. You see the grid column one means that you start from first, 
line and then you end at the third line. And even much more easier, if you don't need to precisely say on which line to start, you can just tell the item how much cells, how many uh, lines to span. So span two, that means that it will span two grid cells. Yeah. Even better, we can name those grid lines. So if numbers doesn't make sense and it's hard to keep track of how many lines you have, you can give it a name for each of the lines. So the syntax for this is those square brackets and then the, uh, the name, you can come up with the name yourself. You don't need to use, well, I think you cannot use dash in it. So the names has to be without any minus or dash symbol in it. Or maybe it can have, I'm not sure. Yeah, but in, in this example, you see we have start, middle and end. It's a, a lot easier to tell where to place the item just by saying grid column start and then forward slash end. So we know that it's gonna span the whole line, the whole row, I'm sorry, yeah, the whole row of that. Um, yeah, it makes more sense than numbers. Now, another question might be like, what happens when we have more items than we have the grid cells? Is it gonna be placed on top of the existing ones and this way covering them? Uh, actually not, the actual behavior of the browser would be that it will automatically create the rows for you, extra rows or uh, implicit rows and columns. You can change the axis, also create columns instead of rows. Um, so basically, yeah, it, it, in other words, it just creates the rows for you automatically. But then the thing is that, that the height of the row really depends on the content of that element. Yeah, so if we have lots of text in there, maybe the height of that row will be taller. But if you want to precisely say, um, control the how tall those uh, implicit rows have to be, you can use this property here, grid O to rows on the container. And another function, which is also comes with the CSS grid layouts feature is min max. So the first value is the minimum value. So at least 100 pixels tall. Uh, and the auto means that if I have more content, I can expand and to be even more than 100. Okay, so changing axis is another topic. We know that on the Flexbox, we can change axis from a horizon, horizontal to vertical, from row to column. We can do the same here. Um, by default, it, it generates extra rows. So each row will, will, will be generated after another one. But if you don't like this behavior, you wanna switch the axis, that means you wanna generate columns instead. You can do so with grid out of low and then selecting column as a choice. It could be useful if you're creating some kind of like a Trello board or maybe slideshow or anything you need where you need to have the elements placed um, horizontally. And then what about the favorite framework bootstrap? You know, it gives you like a suggestion to use the 12 grid columns and then you just have to apply the class name to the element and then that element automatically spans that different uh, um, amount of, of, of columns on that grid. That's basically possible to do so. You see with the code example here, we can use the repeat function, which we say that we need to repeat 12 times with one fraction. That basically is the same as saying one FR, one FR, one FR 12 times. Yeah, so it would be nonsense to do that. If you can use this, this simple function, repeat 12 comma one FR, it will give you the same thing. And also the grid gap is set to 16 pixels, which I think it is the default of booster. Maybe it's 15, I'm not sure, but that's basically the way you can create your own bootstrap way uh, for the grid. Although I would say that it's that exactly, it's, this is exactly what we want to avoid because that creates, a, well, this is a completely different approach. Again, it, the content itself controls the grid, but not the grid. So with this approach is just a quick way to escape um, the bootstrap framework and to have the same functionality, but doesn't give you an, an advantage of actual grid system uh, CSS grid uh, feature provides, like you now creating completely different layout and different uh, screen sizes and generating, switching different um, columns and rows on depending on screen size. But of course you can do so. And to create this Pinterest-like layout where we have lots of dynamic things going on, uh, you see it does, it's not that boring compared to the bootstrap thing. What does it have? It has four columns we have auto rows, that means that it automatically generates rows and we have, if, if we have more items than the grid is, is defined. Um, also we have the grid cap, you see those little gaps. Mm, some columns, some, some tiles, no, not tiles, uh, some content, some elements span two uh, grid cells, some is just one. 
sum three, yeah? No, it's just two or one. Yeah, but the last piece, which is the question mark, what was missing to create this kind of layout, because if you just leave it without this grid out of low dense, uh, it will leave some empty gaps if it doesn't fit. Yeah, so with this grid out of low dense, it will try to automatically push some elements up in a row and if there are some extra space uh, and tries to fill that empty space there. So it creates Pinterest like layout very easily without extra JavaScripting on the front end. Now, another question which is hard for me to answer because myself personally, I've never experienced the need to use autofill. Everything is, is okay to use autofit, but technically what it does, it basically, the, the main difference between them is that with autofit, it won't create tracks out of empty space. This is what I found somewhere. And with autofill, it will create extra grid cells. So I'm not sure. If you find the autofill somewhere useful, let me know, it would be interesting. Um, yeah, this also another uh, CSS grid feature allows us to use another concept uh, which we can call it responsive without media queries. That means we can create a responsive layout which changes itself when we move or change the browser width or maybe we go to other screen device and on other devices with the different screen sizes. And that media query is no longer needed if we apply the auto fit with the min and max uh, function. And we use also repeat. So that means basically how to translate that into a human language. Well, if you have lots of items, any number of items, doesn't matter, it automatically will, will create a grid like a tiles for you uh, with this uh, in mind that each of the tile has to be at least to 60 pixels wide. And if it has extra room, it, it can grow. Yeah, similar how flex, Flexbox works. Yeah, but you can change it and, and also control the, uh, not only the template column, but of course you can add extra uh, property to control how the, those uh, implicit rows appear. And I'm going to give you one uh, an example of this responsive without media queries um, in a demo session. Yeah, so a bit of quick tips of how to remember about the alignment. So we have this uh, approach that if it says justify dash something, usually it means about horizontal alignment. Yeah, so we have options like justify content item self. I have that in mind. If it says align dash something, it you. Usually we talk about the vertical one, unless we of course swap the uh, axis, uh, similar to Flexbox, yeah, but just the way to remember. Then another uh, a way to uh, have in mind, another thing to have in mind is that if the end part, yeah, if it says content, usually it is about the grid track itself. And we already know what the grid track is, right? So we have justify content, align content, if it says items, we talk about individual grid items and then we can do the alignment there. So justify is for horizontal, align for vertical and so on. And we also have the last one is the self alignment where each element self element, it's not um, now on the parent element. You need to use that feature or property on the children. And then you can control the children itself, uh, how it, it is aligned it's, uh, to, to the grid. and. The last feature, and uh, I think the one which I like the most from this grid, CSS grid, is this uh, grid template areas and how you can name them. So, you know, we know that we can have lines, we can have named lines, but we can, uh, at the same time, we can also have the name template areas. And in this example, you see that I have called them header, header, a side, main, footer, footer. What does that mean? And that's a very uh, well, interesting syntax to see in CSS. Uh, if we look at the upper one, which says grid template columns, we know that we have two columns. The first one is one fraction. So if it has extra space, it will take the whole thing. And the second one is then starting, uh, well, at least 200 pixels wide, and then it takes two times uh, more space than the first column, available space, free space. Um, so basically two columns, yeah? And the template area is, is, is defined just with the uh, quotation marks and those lines, each line um, it's, it represents a row. So on the first row, we have two columns and, and that call, uh, that template area will be called the header because I used header header name twice. So that means that the whole, um, the first row of both columns will be called header. On the second row, we have 
two columns again, but then the first column will be called a site and the second column is gonna be name. And then lastly, we have the third one, which is footer footer again, the footer will span two columns. So it's very easy then for the grid items you wanna place onto that grid to tell where to go. You can just say grid dash area and then header. And we know that the header always gonna be placed in that header area. And the nice part is that you can, based on the media queries on a different screen size, you can change the grid. You can redefine the grid. You can make one column or three columns and then change the template areas leaving the same names, but in, a, in different order. And that will make the whole magic for you. And it's very easy to change uh, the order of HTML, change the, uh, the width, the column number. So yeah, that's what I was lo uh, looking for. And I can't imagine building layouts without it right, right now, because that's really beautiful and easy to do. And yeah, I think this is the time for demo. What I want to share, uh, let me know if you see the screen. I think I see, you can see it. Um, yeah, so first I'm gonna show you this responsive uh, uh, med without media queries, right? So this is what, what we have. If I go and drag from the corner, see it changes the columns and also at the same time rows, yeah. And it is done very easily without using any media queries. I can prove that just by showing you a source code and you can see no media queries here. What I have here in HTML part is this container with lots of boxes. And then this is where the magic is, yeah, this line here, which automatically does auto fit to 60 one FR. Uh, each row will take one FR. Grid gap is 10 pixels and the height of that container always gonna be one eight, uh, 100 percent or viewport height. Okay, so this is without media queries. Another uh, thing is what you can change with the, temp the grid template areas is this layout. Yeah, so let's think of this layout as a desired layout for the desktop users or for the light screen, uh, wide screen users. And for the smaller screens, we wanna change it completely different. Yeah, so maybe one column like this, header, main content, a side footer goes there. If I reduce it even smaller to smaller size, and then we have two columns on the second row and so on. Yeah, so that's completely different. And just the way to illustrate how it works, I'm gonna show you the source code again. So I'm using semantic tags, header, a side with some classes, basically telling the same thing. Mm, and then I have this columns defined here, two columns we have, um, you know, template areas, so header, header, basically similar to what you've seen, uh, what you have seen in the slides. And then I only, uh, I'm placing header to the header area, a side to a side area and so on. And on a different viewport, so on a different media, uh, on a different media queries, you know, different screen sizes, you see I'm changing the grid. I'm just redefining the grid. Here we have, again, the same two columns, but the template areas are swapped or changed you know, if we compare to the default one. And then we have another, uh, resolution where I have this one column and this is how they stack on top of each other. This is the order. If you want to change the header with the footer, it's very easy. You can just create another media query and just swap the order of the header and the footer saying that footer is first and the header is at the bottom, right? And that, that will do the thing. Um, and lastly, this is the more sophisticated page, although it's very simple. I also use the CSS grid to build this. So the interesting part is Again, the, uh, the responsiveness and the use of using CSS grid. So have a look at this main part and, and also keep an eye on the uh, right-hand side for the sidebar. See how it changes itself. Yeah, nothing special unless you look at the code and understand how it works. So of course you can achieve the same thing with the floats and flexbox, but the interesting part from this example is this. I think this is uh, where I need to go and open the, uh, the ID for that. So yeah, again, I'm gonna demonstrate the simplicity of the uh, elements, just collapsing the, the main ones which are required to understand. Uh, I do apply the grid on this grid container. So it has children elements like header, main, and a side, only three of them. And why I leave the footer here outside of this container because I use this flexbox feature to move the footer down, You're kind of creating that sticky, foot, uh, sticky footer effect. But if you have more content, it's not gonna, it's not the same as you know 
position fixed because you can scroll down and it's placed at the very bottom. If you don't have enough content, it's not gonna go up. It's always gonna be stick to the bottom. So that's some other interesting uh, layout problems. So, uh, well, the, how to solve that layout problem we had before in the past. So yeah, just looking on the structure, you see the main part is this grid container has these three children. If we go to the CSS part, um, this is where we need to look for, I have this two columns, right? We have also some uh, logic for the rows. So the first row always gonna be 50%, 50 pixels tall, sorry. Then I did this calculation. Um, why I did this? Because, well, I need to, um, um, I need to subtract the footer together with the header to make that um, middle row or second row taking the full width, full, uh, full height. And that's auto for all the uh, implicit rows generated. And you see, this is, I'm not sure why that code editor did that, but to make it more easier to read is this two rows. Yeah, so the first one is header, and then we have main and a side. Um, for different resolution, I'm, I'm just changing the grid to make one column. And then this is the order how those elements are gonna be displayed. Interesting thing that inside the A side, if you expand that, I have recent posts H2 and then another div with the class A side content. And this is where I use that technique uh, responsive without using media queries. Yeah, let me show you this. Yeah, so I use this grid template columns with auto fit and setting the rule that at least it has to be 200 pixels wide. And if it has more room, uh, then you know, it, I allow it to expand, to take the full. And then I also applied some grid gaps uh, for the row gap is 32 and the column gap. The column gap is that one with, uh, between the columns and the rows is at the bottom uh, vertically. So 32 and 16 pixels. You can see this is the 16 pixels and then 32 somewhere here for, for that part. And the beauty of this is that it doesn't depend on the media queries. It really depends on the size of its container. So if the size of the, of the container shrinks down or, you know, or maybe widens, um, the layout will change. You know, the content of inside will change. Okay, so you see it shrinks down, so that's why it moves down. So I don't use any media queries for that part. It's just this uh, sidebar or a side element controls that area. And yeah, so that's what I wanted to share. Now going back to the presentation, uh, I know that we uh, we need to also cover some WordPress users here. So what about WordPress users? If I do use WordPress, can I use CSS Grid and so on? Um, and there's a thing with the WordPress. We used to have that with the wig editor. What it says is, it's a what, what I see. You now what you see is what you get. I think this is what it means. Uh, it might be true for Office uh, applications like Microsoft Word. It's exactly when you type something and make it bold, this is exactly what you're gonna get um, after you print it, yeah? But it's not true when we do uh, website editing because it really depends on the theme you're using. And right now, even if you if it looks great and this with a big editor, you save the post, you go to the page and you might experience some differences there because of some CSS applies to it. Yeah, so that with a wig, it doesn't actually work anymore. That's why I think WordPress introduced with this, uh, coming, I think it was with the version five where, where they switch that classical uh, editor to use that block element editor. If, if you're using this block editor, let me know if you like it or not, because uh, after reading some comments in a WordPress plugin uh, directory about that uh, Gutenberg plugin, I saw that some people love that new editor and some people and lots of people actually hate it because I think the reason why they hate it because they were very used to that old way of changing uh, content. And yeah, so let me know if, you, if you're if happy with this new change for WordPress. And why this, well, th th this area, what it does basically allows you to change only one part of your website because WordPress sites are powered by themes or templates, some different files which control the appearance of your overall page. So those uh, files are typically called like this. 
well, different theme will of course use a different structure, but similar, well, this is like a very basic one. Let's say we imagine this uh, very common layout where we have at the very top some logo with some navigation part. This is, can, can be in, into, you know, all the logic can be written in a separate file called the header.php. Then we have the footer, of course, and then the content and sidebar. And the whole composition of this is uh, also, yeah, the whole composition comes into this index.php file, which is the main file, file you load on your homepage. Uh, there are, of course, there are some other files you can go and explore uh, because of the different views. We have single post view, we have list of post view, we have archive page, calendar page, and all, all kind of different ways to represent data. But what I wanted to share is that with the WYSIWYG editor of that content creation uh, editor, you're only changing this content part. This is where your blog post appears. Basically, if we go back to, to the previous demo, and if you think of this as your WordPress site, the only thing you're changing is basically this part. And actually, title is uh, also not part of that WYSIWYG editor. It comes from a template. Um, yeah, if you go and, and look at the um, classical editor, you see there's a two different fields where you enter the title and then another field where you can enter some text content pictures and whatever it is, uh, where you can make them bold, italic, and so on. So basically, you're controlling only this part, right? So everything else is defined by your theme. So what I'm saying is that you can use grid, CSS grid uh, inside here, yeah, but you're not gonna be able to change anything unless you create your own theme or create a child theme based on your existing one and then tweak the files, which basically is the task for web developers, not for site builders. Um, yep, so going back to, to my um, example of WordPress, I have this WordPress site where of course, I can go and edit something there. And let's say I go to this hello world post. And I do use this new uh, block editor yeah, where I can put some text in it. I can uh, add extra blocks. I can also see what's possible. Actually, I haven't used that for a while. Yeah, I need to click plus to see what blocks you can add. And also interesting feature patterns where you can basically add some patterns. It, feels more natural compared to that with the big editor because you can, well, it, it's it's closer to what you're gonna get at the very end, right? It still gives you and clutters the interface with all these options on the sides, uh, on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, but still it, it is a bit better preview of what you're gonna get in, in the end. But, but it still doesn't give you much options about the general layout of the page. So, Having that in mind, you can of course go and browse and, uh, for the themes, for the different themes. Something, some markets are like this. Uh, this one is very popular. And I found one theme which actually is built using the CSS grid layout and it says that here. Although you see that they have the warning that some browsers might not actually support those things. But on the last time I checked, the browser support for grid uh, layout is, is very good except with some, of course, um, browsers, which will perhaps never only have, will never have that uh, support for the CSS grid. And of course you can work around that and have the fallback for this. So I recommend to go and explore those uh, CSS grid themes, not necessarily go and purchase something there. Probably there are some free ones you can go and download and explore. And, and you can build, or uh, uh, you can go in and find and build your own theme, but, uh, I was promised. Uh, I promise you to give some other tips. Yeah. So the one, uh, the one tip for the area you can actually change with the WYSIWYG or block editor is uh, this area. And I used one plugin called Grids. Uh, see, so normally you don't see this button, but after installing uh, the plugin, you're gonna, you're gonna get this Grids, which allows you to create uh, some some Grids. Yeah. So you can create. Well, I think you can change it for first I need to remove. Yeah, you could click plus and then you can use this section where you can select from, from predefined layouts. And the last one is the, the most interesting one is this, where you can create your own areas. And you can even make them overlap to create that dynamic hierarchical grid. And then once you do that, you can have the uh, places where you can put some content. And of course I need to, no, uh, spend more time exploring this, but I hope you like it. Yeah, so as the plugin name uh, is, uh, you can go to the, oh, I need to see what are the plugins. 
uh, yeah, this is the plugin I use, the grids. Yeah. And if you are so, someone who doesn't like the new one, uh, the new editor, there's a plugin also for you. It's called Classical or Classic Editor. You can activate that one instead of the, the new one. And you'll be able to use the Classic Editor for all your posts. Yeah, so just to remind you how it looked before, this is your WYSIWYG as it used to, used to be before. And I think this is where I want to end unless we have some comments. We actually do. We do both have comments and questions. So maybe let's start with the comments. I see people going, oh my God, how simple is that? You explained it so well or very good. And we also have a couple of questions. So first I'm going to apologize if I mispronounce uh, some names and surnames, but then you can just go right back at me and mispronounce my name, I will not mind. And let's go with the first question. And if you see, that's a very active person that was here from the beginning. And the question is, which editor you are using to build CSS file? Editor. Oh, I use the VS Code to write this. Uh, well, not only CSS, but also HTML and JavaScript. Yeah, so this uh, Visual Studio Code, it's free. You can works on every platform, Mac, Windows, Linux. So yeah, I recommend to use that one. Okay, so would you recommend it? Then? Yes, okay. sure. Okay, one more question. It's a little bit longer, All right? So we have a question from Mark saying, how could we edit the theme CSS grid, for example, 2021 theme, which I am trying to understand. Is there a way, for example, to select the logo and see the code highlighted in the CSS file? Okay, so 2021, 20, so that's the newest one, I think, yeah. So any theme actually in, in WordPress, if you look at this, uh, you know, appearance, uh, and you, you select any theme. So I think this is 2019, 2021 is this one, right? So if you activate that, that's the current one. You can click on the theme editor. However, I'm not recommend, I don't recommend to edit these files directly because that's the actual, um, you know, source code of your theme function. But you, you'll find the, the file called style.css. This is actually all the CSS written for that theme. The best approach would be to create a child theme based on that 21 theme and do some, alter, well, some or, or write some styles there. So this way you are safe in case you update that theme in the future. So you're not gonna lose the hard work and you know to keep that untouched is better than to accidentally break it and not having site working at all. So yeah, so keep in mind that you need to back up something maybe. Yeah, the best approach would be to create a child theme and then um, create your separate style sheets there. And then you can go and of course use the dev tools to see the styles or classes you need to overwrite using the inspector. Yeah, so you can select the element to see what is the class of that. You see the class is site dash title. And of course, if you create a style sheet and, and put some you know, uh, properties there, you can change the way site looks. Yeah? So adding okay. some extra CSS. And maybe a rhetorical question a bit, right? May you watch this video again? So for those wondering who maybe missed it, I saw some people also write, no, I'll definitely watch it later. Or who just checked in. So you can definitely watch the video as it is our Hostinger Academy on our Hostinger Academy site. And if you have any additional questions, you can definitely add them in the comments as you do watch it. There's no problem with that. Then do we have anything else? Does anybody else want to ask any, any question? Let's see for a moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those are going to be all the questions today. So first, I'll just remind everybody that you can use the code for a special hosting discount. And Gedeminas, how are you feeling after your talk? Do you think um, you presented everything that you wanted? Well, I think, yeah, that's all, uh, unless we want to, well, yeah, I think it's time to finish, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed it. I hope that people enjoyed it as well. From the comments that we got, I think they definitely did. And then hopefully we're going to have many more talks where you can share your experience and help others as well. Okay. Okay, then. Bye. Bye.